Hi, welcome back to the Blue Forest Farms video series. My name is Jessica Platt and I'm the pest control manager for Yabba Cannaba. We partner with Blue Forest Farms to produce hemp seed and other hemp products. Today we're going to be talking about IPM or Integrated Pest Management. This is a system of using biological, ecological, and cultural controls as opposed to the harsh chemical pesticides used in conventional pest control. The goal is to keep pest populations under the economic threat threshold using ecologically sustainable practices. Populations below that economic threat threshold are just not worth the money and time to treat. The focus of IPM is going to be on the monitoring and prevention of pest populations as opposed to regular treatments with chemicals. Pesticides are still going to be used in an IPM practice, but they're going to be focused on more soft chemistries and very targeted products. IPM is the system of pest management that I recommend because not only is it safer for your employees and the environment, but it's also going to be more sustainable for your business as opposed to fighting the uphill battle against pest resistance when it comes to conventional pest control. The three main tenets of integrated pest management are going to be prevention, monitoring, and then control. So first we're going to talk about prevention. Your goal here is to design an ecosystem that's unfavorable to the growth of pest populations. The first part of that is creating an ecosystem that's favorable to beneficial insects um, that are going to prey on those pests that we want to get rid of. When you stop using chemical pesticides, already some natural beneficial insects are going to come into the space. Now, in addition to that, we're going to introduce new populations of beneficial insects and maintain those over time. The goal of establishing these beneficial insect populations is for them to be there and up and running before your pests even come into the greenhouse. Ways that we work on prevention through cultural controls are going to include sanitizing all of your equipment regularly, using clean and efficient irrigation equipment, propagating in clean conditions, and training all of your employees on how to prevent bringing in new pests to the garden on their clothes, in their hair, on their shoes, that kind of thing. Now we're going to talk a little bit about monitoring. Monitoring is going to be really important for the long-term success here. You're going to want to scout your crops at least once a week and you need to keep very detailed notes as you do. You want the exact location of your pest populations, the general density, um, because you want to be able to track if they're growing, staying static, or maybe going down. The goal of monitoring and scouting every single week is going to be to catch pest populations before they grow to a level that can't be controlled with biological controls. We want to catch it nice and early. There's a few tools that you're going to want to use in your monitoring program. The first one is going to be yellow sticky cards. These guys help us catch a specimen so that we can identify what we've got going on in the garden. As you're going through your garden scouting, you're going to need to have magnification options. This little hand tool always lives in my pocket along with a notebook for keeping detailed notes. Also in the garden you're going to want to have something a little bit bigger. This guy magnifies to 100 times, um, whereas the smaller one till 40 times. So you need to be able to really get a good look at some of your pests. Some of them are way smaller than others. So. As you're scouting, first you're looking for insects, of course, but you're also looking for signs of damage. A lot of times you're going to see damage to the plant or symptoms of damage before you're able to see the pests because they will be so small. So you're looking for things like stipling or damage to leaves, maybe yellowing or le um, leaf wilt. You may see damage to the stems um, or residue or molds and mildews on the leaves that you haven't seen before. So any of those would be signs that we need to take a closer look with our magnification equipment and find out what's going on here. Likewise, sometimes you'll see bugs in your garden without seeing any damage to your plants. In that case, no symptoms, no treatment required. Part of IPM is knowing when you don't need to treat. If you need identification assistance when you've found your insects, you can always contact your local agricultural extension and send in a sample to confirm the identity of your pest. Next, we're gonna talk about the third step, which is control. Once you do find pest populations, it's important to act right away. First, you're gonna identify the pest to the best of your ability. Again, if you need help with this, you can send it to a lab or your state extension. Knowing exactly what type of pest you're working with is really important because in IPM, all of our treatments are very tailored to the pest species specifically. This is why it's so ecologically friendly. 
Your first line of control is going to be your predatory and parasitic insects or beneficial insects. These guys are gonna prey on your pests and help you take care of it in a really natural way. Some of these guys are gonna be generalists, meaning that they'll eat any kind of bug, and some of them are very species specific, so they'll only eat certain species. This is why it's so important to know exactly what species of pest you're working with so you can tailor your predator selection accordingly. Now, of course, you have these guys established in your garden before the pests come, but when you do have outbreaks, you're gonna go ahead and increase your releases to get that population up a little bit. Your second line of defense is gonna be biological pesticides. So these are gonna be sprays and drenches that are very narrowly targeted to your pest species. These might be biological controls such as fungal or bacterial contagions that kill off your pests. They might also be growth regulators that only affect target species. Um, they're definitely gonna be something that leaves little to no residual toxicity on the plant. And it's important to note with these kind of treatments that they often require multiple treatments at a specific interval. So following those instructions are gonna be the difference between success with these types of products and failure. Now your third and final line of defense in your IPM program is gonna be what I call the go nuclear option. This is gonna be something that kills everything it touches um, pretty immediately. Now, even though these do kill everything they touch, they're still part of our program because they don't leave any residual activity. So we can go ahead and release more beneficial insects right away to keep our IPM program up and running. Horticultural oils, soaps, and azadiractin products are a few really good choices for this type of product, but it's important to do research and understand your space. You're gonna to wanna to choose a few products that you can have on hand at all times for when you do need to do these go nuclear treatments. These treatments don't need to be applied to your entire garden. You wanna only use them to spot treat where your outbreaks are. To make sure that you're ready for any outbreaks that you encounter, ahead of time you wanna create a toolbox. This is gonna to be a list of all of the species of predators that you're gonna use, the different biological pesticides, as well as your go nuclear options, your stronger pesticides. Um, that way, when you do have these outbreaks, you're ready to take it on head first. Remember when you're creating your toolbox that every state has different regulations for what products can be used on hemp, so be sure to cross-check that while you're making that list. Now we're going to talk a little bit about switching over from a conventional pest control method to an IPM method. Your first goal is to make the environment hospitable to beneficial insects. Your first step in doing that is gonna be taking a list at the pesticides you're currently spraying and seeing how long the residual toxicity stays in your crop. Once you find that out, you'll know how long you have to wait before releasing beneficial insects of your own. Once that time has expired, beneficial insects will start to come in. You can start releasing yours and getting this ecosystem up and running. Now, make sure that you've done your research and gotten your toolbox ready ahead of time so that during that interval, if you do have outbreaks, you have tools to use against them and you're not caught off guard. One thing to keep in mind when putting together your toolbox and switching over is all of your past experience. You know what pests you tend to run into over and over again on your particular site, so make sure you're factoring that in to your whole plan. Also make sure that you research the procedures required for releasing some of these beneficial insect products. It's gonna be a little bit different than just applying a spray, so you wanna know ahead of time so that you're not scrambling to figure out how to get these live insects into your crop when they arrive in the mail. So a few final reminders on IPM. Your focus is on creating an ecosystem that's pro-predator or beneficial and anti-pest. Prevention is your first weapon, but monitoring is going to be the real key to long-term success with this system. Remember, it's important to accurately identify your pest so that you can tailor your treatments appropriately. Outbreaks are gonna happen, and it's important with the system that you're willing to cut your losses when that's what you need to do. It's always gonna be better to get rid of 50 infested plants if that saves your other thousand. Putting together an effective IPM program might seem daunting because it is a lot of work, but once you get it going, it's effective and it's worth it. Thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, remember to like, share, and subscribe.